We good? Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Sorry about the slightly delayed start, but we are here, and we are going to get started shortly. I just got to push. forgot to do this, do the marketing. But today, we're going to be drawing the snail. And the thing that I wanted to showcase is the different surface and materials from the shell, the body of the snail, and the not scales that he has on the back, but he has like these grooves that are kind of a nice thing that we can draw. And then the top of them, where his eyes are, if you want to call them that, uh, we're going to show some transparency to the, the texture and material of the thinner parts of the membranes. And I'm going to show you how light completely passes through, and that's where we get that subsurface scattering effect. And you see that a lot, especially with like fruit, like oranges and uh, tangerines, those kind of things, where you can get a really cool effect. I'm going to show you how to do it with the snail himself. But really quick, got to post this on all the social networking here. OK. And we're good. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Tim Von Rieden with Concept Cookie, and I'm here with Deandra Pop. And today, we are going to be covering different surfaces. And as always, if you have any questions, leave them on the side, and I will answer them the best I can, or even Deandra will. And uh, even if they don't pertain to the exact uh, what we're working on today, just know that that is what we are going to be doing. And uh, I'm going to be showing my full screen today, so you'll see some of... If you see any of my background, it's just covered with litter of internet screen grabs and references, so ignore that. But I wanted to show you guys the different brushes that we've been creating for the past two weeks and give you a showcase of what you'll be able to download, and they will be uh, available to download later tonight. So with that, and also uh, at the end of the stream, I want to show, I got an art book from one of, an artist that I met at a convention, and she sent me a personal sketchbook, and it was really awesome. So I want to show that with you guys, too. All right, so without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So like I said, here's my screen. I'm going to make this just slightly bigger so you can see it slightly better here. And I also want to have my references on the side. So the references are important because, for me, I think of, like, if I've never drawn a snail before, it's kind of like going into a test without studying for it first. So using reference is giving you, like, a very easy, like, quick reference on what the different materials look like, how the lighting affects the different things, because the snail's body and the shell are going to reflect and absorb lighting differently. So having these references, like, pulled up right next to my drawing, is a great way for me to just uh, reference them. And I think it's also good to note that I'm not just pulling it into my canvas and then just drawing over it or like taking a sketch of it. I think it's important to keep references separate because that way you're observing the reference and you're analyzing it. And then when you're analyzing it, you'll eventually be able to interpret, OK, how can I make my, the reference look just as good on my drawing as it does in the photograph? And then that's when it comes to your actual drawing skills and your tools that you're, you have in your head to be able to analyze it and be like, OK, if I use a brush this way or I need to use this brush for the shine or the sheen on the surface itself here. And that's why I like to keep my references separate. OK, so with that, I'm going to hide this bottom bar. And the snail himself, he is on his own layer. So I can turn that on and off. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make new layers under them. And I'm going to color pick from my reference photos. So I'm going to kind of decide, OK, what color do I want the snail to be? Let's start with darker tones. And if you know the way I like to work, I like to work dark to light. So I like placing my, oops, a little too close to the line art color. So I like working. Um, with like a darker base color, and it gives me some foundation to work on top of. And I like to cover it for most of the entire area. Like if there were two main shapes, so like even for this, I might make the shell a slightly different color. But having that undertone color that you can be pulled from anywhere in the actual subject matter, it kind of relates and keeps the colors cohesive with each other. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of leave that color as it is. And then I'm going to make a new layer. And I'm going to make new layers for each of these so that you guys can easily see like what I'm adding for each. And before I even lay down another color, I have to think, OK, where is my light source coming from? And I think the way I want to do this guy is we're going to have the light source more overhead. Let me get a better yellow here. 
So there's our sun. And I'm going to have it, let's see if I can do the best 3D arrow angle that I can. So slightly from the front. So normally I would have it more from the side, but this one we're going to have more from the front view. Well, you know what? No, I think I want to showcase how to make the shell and the cast shadows that the shell would be having. I think I am going to go more for a side view. So let's go ahead and push it. And like I said, if you guys have any questions on things that aren't even related to the snail at hand, uh, feel free to leave them in the comment section. And Deandra is here to uh, click it so that mm -hmm. we can go ahead and answer it. What? Yeah. Okay. All right, so with the sun coming from this direction, I immediately, in my head, I'm already like lining up where I'm going to be placing the light. And yesterday I was drawing with my friend Joe, and he was asking a lot of questions about how does lighting fall on it. And he did a quick sketch like this where he literally just drew where all the light would fall. And I thought this was a great kind of practice for him to show himself, okay, this is where the light would be shining. And through that, he was able to mentally kind of comprehend, okay, this is where the lights would be falling and everything else would kind of be in the shadow. So with this, I normally, actually I never lay out where my lights are going to go because eventually you get to the point where you already know. Like in your head, you know where the lights are going to fall. And then you just kind of place them down uh, how you see it in your head. I'm going to go ahead and erase that. <clears throat> you got your... One of your first questions is, is it okay to color pick from a photo? Yes, absolutely. All right. Yeah, no quite. Yeah, not even a hint of like, oh, that's kind of wrong. No, in my opinion, that's completely fine. Is it better... Does that, like, distract from... Like, you're learning, though? Like, if if you, like, always color pick and you, like, never, like, build on your ability to, like... I think subconsciously it does build on your ability. Like, I would say I still pick from photos, but I have a swatch. Like, you can see my swatches here. Every now and then I'll put a color in my swatches that I really liked working with. And over time you know, like, which colors you enjoy working with, what colors blend well together. So having the start of, like, working with um, pre-given colors. Like, even the top artists work with, like, a cooler, I don't know how to say the name correctly, K-U-L-E-R, uh, color patches where they already work. So why experiment and try to, you know, create fire when someone's already done it for you? There's no reason to uh, recreate the wheel if it's already done. And I think kind of the same thing with color. But I do agree that if you are trying to do something on your own, um, be very leery on how you do it. Uh, go for more subtle tones, more muted, and then keep your uh, colors, saturations isolated, and that would probably be my biggest advice. But I think working from reference photos, well, it depends. If you're working from someone else's art, I think that's a little different than using, like, real-life photo references. But over time, you will be comfortable with color. Just keep pushing through it. And I know a lot of artists really struggle, or they don't feel comfortable with art or with color, but trust me, in time, you'll get it the more you do it, and you'll find, like, what colors you enjoy shading and coloring with, too. And your next question is, who are your favorite artists to look at for use of color? Uh, Purple Kecleon and Chaotic Muffin are the first two that ring my mind. But then if I was saying, like, more recently, I would say I really like very muted colors like Norman Rockwell, and I would say those are my three that I'm really inspired by right now. Okay. And the last person asked, when will your tutorial with the grill in yellow come out? Uh, it should be this Friday. We had some problems because I was going to release it yesterday, but then the artist reveal was yesterday and I was really caught up working on the brushes. And it was supposed to be last Friday, but then um, there were so many requests for textured brushes that I felt it was necessary for me to do a separate tutorial on that because I think having the look of a textured brush is just a setting in your brush settings. It's 
not so much a brush that you can just download and use like you would in like Paint Tool Sai or something. So mm -hmm. look for it either this Friday, but I am going to San Diego this Friday for the Comic Con. So if any of you are uh, in California or in the area, and I'll be wearing the Concept Cookie t-shirt, so just come up to me and say hi. I'm going to be the only one there, so I definitely will not turn away anyone that uh, is looking for someone to talk to. And right now I'm still keeping that light in mind as I paint the top of the head. So the top of the head is kind of angled directly toward the light. So that's why I'm giving the top of the head, or this like flat surface on the top, more of that color. And then it kind of pillow shades around the edges here. And for the eye, as it gets thinner, and I really want um, my reference photo that I'm kind of using are like the top four ones, where I'm going to make it really thin to the point where the background color is going to be seeping through. But for now, let me do. I'm going to lay down the color first, and then work in the background color later. So I'm going to make it pretty apparent with this color. Are you ever hesitant to like color over your lines? No, I'm doing it right now, actually. <laughs> oh, is that a question, or are you? No, I'm just asking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this, is, this is something I talk about in the tutorial with the yellow girl, or the yellow dress girl, where I was given line art from Kent, who is uh, our blender cookie artist, and he asked me to color it. So right away, I took his line art, and rather than trying to like color under it and you know make his lines still apparent in the final image, I just drew right over them keeping his line art in mind, but I don't like to have that be something that limits me or limits the way I want to color it. Because oftentimes I think we get too scared that if our line art looks kick-ass, that we are going to ruin it by adding color. So I just throw that notion away by just drawing right over it, and it forces me not to be scared. And I think that's a good habit to get into, especially if you're not comfortable using color. You're never afraid of, like, losing the detail? No, Usually because my line art is so, I don't want to say bad, but in my opinion, it's not nearly as great as my color work is. So in my mind, I'm like, how do I improve my line art? It's not like, how can I save my line art? Mm. But for those that are really good at line art, it is tough. Like, if you have really clean, neat-looking lines, I would color under it, depending on how thick your line weights are. Like, if your line weights are really thin, then yeah, I probably would keep the line on top. But if it is really thick and it kind of overshadows the colors, it can still work. Now, it's just personal preference for me where I would much rather add a lot of color and make it look uh, pretty that way. But if your liner is kind of like the selling point of your image, then yeah, of course, showcase that over your color work. Do you have any tips on how to paint the clouds from the new exercise? Uh, yes. There's going to be a full step-by-step uh, -step next Friday that I'm going to release. And drawing clouds, I'm not even really that comfortable with. Even that feature image, it took me like an hour just to make that simple cloud thing. But uh, the one thing I have learned is sh uh, shape it out. And I know cumulus clouds are kind of the overdone, overused ones, but there's a reason for that. I think they're very shapely, which um, gives it an easy excuse to like add form and add uh, color in the way that the lighting would be hitting it. Clouds that are more wispy and thin, I would say those are the tough ones. But the ones that are thicker, you can almost just think as actual shapes in the air, but keep the surface irregular. And the more that you do that, the easier it will be to complete the clouds. And I'm really glad. I hope you guys really uh, take this exercise and do it. I think this is a good one, especially uh, not just for uh, environment artists, but any artist. Like, I know this is something I've always struggled with, environments, and this is like a good stepping stone to get started. This is like a good beginner exercise to do environments. In which case do you decide to work with black and white, or do you always start with colors? I personally always start with colors, just because I love, like, this is something I really enjoy doing, where if you really don't enjoy doing color, then yeah, I would recommend using grayscale first so you can see the values. And uh, for me, like, if I'm, if you want to go straight into color, here's a trick I can do that you might want to do as well. 
So down here on your layers menu, I don't know how clear you can see this, but you can choose the one that's half, it's like a circle and it's cut in half. Then you go to hue and saturation. It makes this hue and saturation layer mode, and if I change it with my saturation all the way down, I'm going to close it then, you can turn that layer on and off because then anything under that layer mode will uh, be affected. So this is something that I know a lot of artists do where if they go into color, they want to make sure their values are still working. So they'll make this hue saturation layer mode and they'll turn it on and off every now and then just to see how their, the contrasts in their values are turning up. And as you can see right now, it's still looking pretty flat. I mean, the subject matter is still popping off the background a little bit, but we want to really emphasize those later on. So as of right now, this is kind of the difference we've made, but I want to keep pushing that further. Now for the snail color, this is kind of like the neutral color right here. Neutral color. And then the highlight color is here. Or not the highlight, the next tone up is here. And I think the problem that I see with a lot of young artists is they think that you have to have a shadow color and the shadow color has to be like dark, dark. It has to be like this. But unless if it's like an ambient occlusion shadow, for the most part, the, sh the areas that aren't receiving life will be more of this neutral color. So I'm not even going to really add shadows except for in the places that are like deep creases. So in areas around the mouth, if I make this more of like an animated looking slug, kind of like from Turbo, but maybe a little more realistic, I might add like a subtle shadow, but for the most part I'm going to keep it more flat in this color. And that's because uh, shadows don't add or multiply your darkness or your value. If anything, there's just no light to increase that value. And make sure you flip your image. That's something that I recommend, and I want to be one of those people that practices what they preach. So definitely flip it all the time. I would recommend it at least like once every 10 minutes minimum. If more than that, then that's even better. Got to make a new layer. Did you draw this in Photoshop first, the sketch, or traditionally? Um, in Photoshop. And I used it with my chalk brush, so that's why it kind of has that stubble looking edge to it because I, I love the chalk brush it's probably my number one go to at the moment but there are a lot of cool brushes and I'm really excited to show some of the new ones that I created yesterday and I hope you guys uh, will like them if you go ahead and download them as well any news on the portfolio tutorial that one, I actually opened up my portfolio book, and that one I'm going to record next. So that's the next full tutorial I'm going to record. But like I said, I'm going to be in San Diego this upcoming weekend, so it probably won't be this weekend or maybe late next week or the week after. Because then I'm also driving down to Chicago. We're going to start really fleshing out the workshop that I keep mentioning in the fall. So I want to make sure that uh, that keeps progressing that's like my probably number one priority right now. And right now with the shell, I'm just kind of giving it some more value. So I'm giving it that 3D sense. And I'm doing that with the light source in mind. Now the one thing that seems a little wonky is if the light source is coming from this way, his head would be blocking a lot of that light, and then that shadow would fall on the shell itself. So now for the, sh the shadow that would fall on the shell, I'm going to just choose this brown that I've been using, and I'm just going to lay it right there. And I'm going to make it slightly thinner as we get up because there would be more bounce light and indirect light hitting it. But then as it gets closer to the body of the slug, so where the shell kind of meets where the body is, it's almost touching, it'll probably be more dense in that shadow. Why do you bother flipping the image? So flipping the image lets you see any mistakes or any proportions or things that might not look right. Because sometimes when you're looking at something like this for so long, and this is something I even want to do a tutorial about, but I have to like purposely draw an image that looks great in like one view, but then when you flip it, you can really see how awkward or misshapen it might be. And usually you see it more with like characters and their anatomy or their proportions. 
But that's not to say you can still see it with like a snail drawing, for instance. And your next question is, other than the workshop that you're working on for later this year, are there any workshops you would recommend for a mid-range artist? Right now, uh, definitely nothing with CG Cook that I know is in the works. I know I want to do a more advanced one later on, but right now I'm kind of focusing toward like more of the beginner to intermediate stuff. But if you're an intermediate, I know this is something Deandra is doing. Uh, CGMA has really great classes. And for a while, they were two of the color and light classes were taught by two of like my favorite artists, uh, Tyson Murphy and Ryan Lang. So they definitely have like top-notch artists doing um, great classes. I haven't taken one myself. I took an environment one last or two years ago. I didn't really enjoy it as much because I uh, mistakenly took the more intermediate environment class, where I definitely needed more of the beginner environment stuff. But uh, CGMA has great ones. Um, I would say the next good ones, maybe Nomen. I have seen some good Nomen workshops out there. But I would say right at this moment, the one that I would top rec most recommend would be the CGMA classes. And you can still register. I think it's until the end of this week you can still register. Don't quote me on that. But if you're interested, definitely get on to doing that. Do you have any knowledge about dynamic cinematic lighting? If so, do you have a video about it where you talk about it in depth? No, I personally do not. That stump, Stuff like that, if it's like storyboarding or anything including environments, I usually don't create tutorials on that just because I'm not fully confident in myself in creating something like that. And I'd rather do tutorials on stuff I am confident and I am like, positive I can answer any questions about it or really feel like I'm teaching the right subject matter, then like just kind of give it my best shot and like hope I get some uh, stuff correct. So on Concept Cookie, we do not have anything on that yet, but we just signed up uh, two different artists that I can't announce yet for the fall extravaganza. So the summer extravaganza has been going really well, where we have a new tutorial every week from a different artist. And we decided we're just going to keep that train going and push it into the fall. So we've already contacted, I think there's six artists on board for the fall one. And one of them I literally just uh, hired to do some a tutorial pretty much on that exactly. Like setting up your scenes using dynamic, dynamic lighting and talking about uh, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Sorry about that. And right now, if I turn on my hue and saturation, you can still, it's still looking, I mean, now the slug is definitely a different value than the shell, but we still have, like, no intense contrast going on, and that's good. I like to keep a lot of that stuff toward the end, like, during the highlighting and polishing stage, because right now I'm just trying to build a really nice base that I can place my highlights on top of, pretty much. Now, here's something that I really want to pay focus to, is how the shell it has these two colors, this color here and this color here, and they butt up right against each other. And that's what gives the illusion of form and depth. So it almost appears that this part of the shell is popping out this way of the shell, the middle shell. And I think having those two colors butt up right against each other give that illusion. So you don't just have to think in like value contrast, you can also think in like hue contrast as well. Can you explain how subsurface scattering works? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as soon as I get more to like the head area, I will explain it more in depth. But I guess a quick little thing is light permeates the surface and then it like bounces around in the actual material depending on what it is. Like that's why some things you don't see it in. Like wood, you don't really see subsurface scattering. But then like an orange, you do, or like the snail eyes up here you do. It just kind of depends on the actual material and a lot of times the surface as well. And you, you get those really cool effects. That's why if there is a subject matter that you're working on that 
can do it, I would say take advantage of it and really make it look like the best you can because it will really give your piece a cool little uh, added bonus to it pretty much. Could you make a tutorial on how to sketch a cartoon-style character like this snail? Yeah. Um, I never really thought I was, like, super strong in cartoon stuff until, like, last year where I, I really thought, or I, I created something, and I was really, like, proud of it, and it was really easy for me. So I think I should do something more in a cartoon style because I think it's more fun. You have to work and think in shapes, and I think shape language is something that I've always really enjoyed. So I can definitely do a tutorial on that. I think Piper did a great one for us for Concept Cookie. Uh, she did it, I think, a couple weeks ago, and it's on the site right now. And she just talks about uh, shape language and how that affects what you draw. Just It was a really good one, and I, I recommend that one a lot. But yeah, I, I definitely think I could create my own. But as of now, I don't want to keep adding to my plate if I still have so many on board in the deck, uh, like the, tuto the portfolio one. I definitely want to get out there. Okay, so right now I'm just kind of doing nothing. I'm not really adding anything to the piece. If you find yourself kind of like nonchalantly drawing on it, you're not really adding any interest, make a new layer and do something different because then you're just wasting time at that point. So let's focus on the head because I think this is a great thing that we can start on. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to edge out this head a little more. Ooh, I don't like that color. Use more of a neutral gray. Okay, so I'm going to edge it out, and this is what will really separate your subject matter from the background. And mind you, all these layers are on top of that line art layer, so that's why as I draw it, I'm kind of covering the original line art that I had, but at the same time, I'm creating a new line art, but it's not an actual line. It's just the illusion of the two colors butting up against each other that gives you that separation. So that's why I like working in colors, because you don't need a line to separate forms. You just create budding um, hues next to each other to create that line. If an object is in the dark, how would you show contrast, knowing that there's little light coming through? There wouldn't be that much contrast. But like I said, if you guys don't know what um, ambient occlusion is, it's a 3D term, but it pretty much means that uh, there will always be like a little, there will be slightly more value in shadows in like areas that are slightly hidden or like two forms meet each other. So like underneath the shirt of your arms, like the armpit area would have an ambient occlusion. Um, inside the nose would have an ambient occlusion. So everything would have like a soft value to it. So if something's in shadow, it'll still have that ambient occlusion to it. But for the most part, it will be a little tougher to show forms because then, yeah, you really have to rely on um, not lighting to showcase the different forms, but the way you work color. All right, Denny asks, I practice a lot with basic shapes and lighting from different angles. However, I struggle when it comes to more complicated shapes. Can you give me a tip on how to lighten more complicated shapes, how to approach it, and what is your approach? I try to simplify everything. So even with like a complicated shape, try to break it down the best you can into a simple shape. And I'm not saying like everything has to be a sphere or a box, but even like a rhombus or a cylinder, like shapes that you know how to shade and how light would affect them, and then apply it the best you can to a more complicated shape. So, I mean, if you could give me an example of what you're working on that you're not sure on how to color, I think that I could give you a better explanation of how I would go about uh, shading it. But always try to break things down into simple shapes, because the more that you do that, the easier it is to recognize and analyze, like, okay, I know how to shade this. I just have to, you know, take step one, two, and three, and I can make it look the way that I'm, I want it to. Okay, so here we have our snail. So then in the areas, so I'm going to use this top right reference because I really like how clear it almost makes the eye look. 
And I'm not sure what these are actual called. I know they're not antennas. Or they might be called antennas. I'm pretty sure they're not, though. And I'm going to thin out the color up here. And then I'm going to keep looking back and forth at my reference to what I'm working on. Then I can see, and then I might like use a different reference it's, if it's hard to see. That's why I like to pull up multiple ones. So like here I can see the clear membrane kind of comes almost to the base of the eye. Or whatever you want to call this thing. I should stop calling it by incorrect names because I'm not sure what this thing is called, but I'm pretty sure... You know what? I'm not even going to guess it. I'll just say this is his eye. And then you can see underneath he has... The, what almost looks like a vein that connects the top of this eye to the actual body. And then that black vein, you can just see it, and it goes into the head itself. So the trick is here, like the challenge that we're presenting ourselves is making this look transparent, enough to where you can actually see this vein, this thick vein underneath the skin, or whatever you want to call the surface. You know what? I probably should have just kept the background darker for this one. And I think I'm going to do just that. Maybe we'll have like a fade, because it's easier to see the contrast between the light and the dark if I have a darker background. And already you can see I'm giving it that look. And I'm really focusing on the edge of the eye. The edge I want to be lighter than the actual inside. Make a new color that in a little better there. What is ambient occlusion? Can you achieve it in Photoshop? Yeah, uh, it's not like in um, modeling. It's definitely like uh, whenever you model anything, it'll have an ambient occlusion to it. Unless if you turn it completely off, then you get like the two tone flat shadows. But it's something where there will always be like um, this. It's not like a direct light. It's very ambient lit, but it's very soft, and it gives very soft shadows everywhere. And I always imagine... That's why I think it was good that I did go to a 3D art school, because then I'm able to take what I learned in 3D and apply it to digital art, where I really understood that that's, that ambient light uh, or that ambient occlusion shadow is very much apparent in a lot of my work, and I think it's because I took 3D. And I think it's because those shadows add that little touch of detail that can make something look that much more realistic. Yeah, the vein go up here. Now, I'm not an expert on snails. I would probably even do more research to like find out more about like what are these eyes and like what is the vein that's in it so that I can better understand how to represent and draw that the best I can. But since this is a live stream, and I'm imagining like if I was doing like client work and I had a limited amount of time, I'm just going to do the best of my ability and the best of my knowledge to create this. Uh, a user uh, answered a question. They're called eye stocks. Eye socks? Stocks. Stocks. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, the eye stocks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a good base. Now, notice I didn't add any highlights yet. And I may add highlights to the head once I finish this area, but normally I would save the highlights till the very end. Let's go ahead, and what I'm going to do really quick, merge those layers together. I'm going to copy this eye sock. <laughs> stock. I'm going to keep calling it a accident. And then paste it to the other side. And now, like I said, I was imagining I'm on a time crunch, and since I don't want to make it look like I just copy and pasted, I'm going to edit it a little bit, make it smaller. And I can either use Liquify, or lately I've been using Warp, which is under your Edit Transform. Now let's warp it to fit the original concept that I had. Like I said, if this was more of like an illustration piece, I would probably take the time to illustrate both sides. But if you're on a time crunch and efficiency is, needs to be at like an all-time high, then I would just go ahead and copy and paste wherever you can. Especially in areas like that where you can just quickly recreate it and still edit it a little bit to give it that difference. 
Your next question is, I seem to be older than most of the digital artists I come across, which I'm getting more and more self-conscious about. Do you think age will be an inhibitor in getting work in the field? No. In my opinion, talent is always, or it, it's, not, it's not even a quote I said originally. It's someone, I wish I could remember who it said it, but they said that talent is always in request. No matter how old you are, like no matter what your background is, if you're talented, you'll get a job. So don't feel, because even sometimes I feel like I'm old, like when I hear like a 13-year-old uh, asking me a question about Photoshop, and I'm like, I didn't even know what Photoshop was when I was 13. Um, just know like the younger generation is definitely becoming more acclimated and like familiar with things that we weren't familiar with when we were younger. But don't let age uh, kind of break you down or intimidate you. So no, I don't think it, age matters at all. Do you have any advice on how to photograph traditional artwork? Do you have any advice on how to photograph traditional artwork? Like how to scan it in so you can work digitally? Yeah, like just like having to sketch down the like, or like line art, and then when you like try to scan it or take a picture, like it often gets like kind of gross looking in the process. Uh, personally, I don't mind if it gets a little gross looking because I think that adds a te paper texture to it. Like I know I did that for my tutorial on um, the soft edge brush character where I literally took a photo with my my cell phone and I used that and I just uh, sent it to an email to myself and opened it up in Photoshop. I think sometimes that graininess that a picture can often give you can help it. But if you're one of those people that like are really liking how their line art works on like a flat background, I know I'll, a lot of my friends don't like having any graininess or like any uh, of the traditional paper or whatever they drew on a scene. Then yeah, I would probably use a scanner and make sure it's a very cl like clean scan the best you can. Maybe even edit the value and the contrast in the settings of the scanner as well. And then do your best to get a good clean scan. But don't feel like it's a failure if you don't get a clean scan because in my opinion, I like working on pieces that aren't perfectly clean. I think having some of that subtle texture actually helps the piece. Well, I think um, if you're planning on coloring it, like it doesn't really matter, but if you really just want to like put your like showcase your line work and like put it on your portfolio like online or something. Um, I know when I was like applying to schools, they asked me to like send me to send them my portfolio digitally, and they suggested like using like the nicest camera you can get your hands on, and just like going outside and using the natural lighting or something. Really? Yeah, that's what they said. Um, because I know my my scanner is awful. Like it looks <laughs> way worse than whatever I had drawn. Um, but yeah, that's something you could probably try. Um, it makes, like, the paper look whiter, you know, um, in, like, your pencil lines or whatever, you know, in my opinion. But, either way. Alright, really quick. So the snail has these two little feelers that... <laughs> I, like I said, I'd never studied snails, so I don't know the biology, but I'm, these they have these two smaller looking head socks, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to try to recreate that here. Since they're thinner, a light would pass through it, and it, they would be lighter in hue than the, than the actual snail body itself. So even the one that's kind of coming directly at the viewer, I'm going to make lighter, and that's what will give it that separation, where you can tell, oh, okay, so that's his feeler on this side. Okay. Do you always use that background color that's behind the snail, or do you change it for every drawing? I change it for every drawing. So I try to give it like a, a feel to the overall mood that I'm trying to create. So for the snail, it's very basic earth tone, and mm -hmm. I think having this very muted 
I wouldn't even say it's like slightly gray purple. Uh, kind of just adds to the overall subject matter. And I usually like having the background color be uh, more muted than any color in the actual piece itself. So it's really just adding a backdrop for my piece to lay on top of. Right, I'm going to start working a little faster. I realize it's already 244. All right, so for the snail head, um, I'm really quickly, so you can see how he has this texture to it. And rather than using a brush, I'm going to actually draw out the little bumps. Because I think sometimes using a brush, while it saves time, if it's something like this where I think I can get it done in like 10 minutes, I'll do my best and try to do it with uh, my brush, my standard brush. So usually I'll lay out a slightly darker color, and then I'll use my lighter color to create those edges. So something like, like that. So rather than going in and drawing out the different edges, I'm just going to draw the bumps themselves, and that's what will give you that surface look to it. Because otherwise you're drawing lines that sometimes are hard and they take away from the overall look of what you're trying to create. So sometimes if you can kind of bypass that by just drawing the actual bumps in the planes rather than drawing the lines that separate them, try doing that. How do you make your lighting make sense with the subject matter, and have you ever seen a piece where the lighting didn't make sense? Oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> I mean, even a lot of my earlier pieces, or even sometimes nowadays, like I'll look at my piece, like, wait, where, how is that receiving any light? And I think sometimes you need to take a step back from your piece and really analyze it purely on, like, a lighting sense. Like, okay, where is that light? Like, how is that cast shadow falling here? And, like, do your best to angle it. Because I know we're not working in a 3D space, but I always imagine everything I work on in a 3D space. Because that way you can definitely imagine how the lighting would affect different areas a lot smoother and cleaner than if you weren't. Because if you're just kind of guessing, then it won't be cohesive, and it'll throw the whole piece off. So I think that's why having that solid understanding of lighting and doing your best to recreate it the best you can uh, will be uh, so much more beneficial to you. So do a lot of lighting practices if you can. We have a few on Concept Cookie, but even if you are just working um, traditionally like in a sketchbook, light something and have like an intense direct light with some bounce light in some area and really observe and try to recreate it the best you can. And maybe even do it in Photoshop. Maybe set up a scene in front of your, or on the side of your computer and do it that way. Will the workshop have a limit to how many people can join? Yes. So only, I believe we're either doing 28 or 30. Because I definitely want it to be small enough where I can feel I'm um, giving each student like a personal experience so I can be able to critique them one-on-one -on -one and really make it feel like uh, they're getting the most out of their money. Where I feel like sometimes if classes become too big, a lot of that personal attention is lost and I definitely don't want to lose that. I really want to make it feel like if you're signing up for this class, you will learn and walk away with uh, a better understanding of digital art. Oh, yeah. So since this is a slightly animated snail, obviously snails don't smile or they have that representation of a smile. But I'm going to give it just a very slight one. And just giving that slight expression almost humanizes it a little bit where you can definitely see an expression. And then it would be easier for an animator to kind of make sense of, oh, okay, that's where his mouth is. I can kind of see how his expressions would lay out from there. And especially if you're working on an animation and if you're working with a team, you definitely want to keep in mind who is going to be receiving this next and make it easier for them. Because you don't want to make it harder for them to interpret your drawing and be like, okay, what was the concept artist thinking for this area? I don't really understand. So do your best to make their job easier. And trust me, it'll be so much better because then if you can imagine how this thing would animate while you're drawing it, 
then the animator will as well. And then they'll be able to animate it kind of exactly the way you saw it when you drew it. OK, now really quick, before I start highlighting this area, I'm looking at this top left re reference picture. And you can see some subsurface scattering on the, the sides of the body, which is really cool. And I think I'm going to add some of that to this guy as well. Is it OK to draw simple shapes above the references to understand it better, and then draw it next to the reference? Yeah, absolutely. The only way I see reference as really kind of cheating or you're not gaining or benefiting from it is if you literally either just draw right on top of it or you take that image and kind of manipulate it to make it your own. Unless, and I know we talked about this in a few live streams back, if you take the photo yourself and then use it to act as like a base or something to draw on top of to save time, like especially environment, sometimes you can't draw every single individual leaf and you have to some, use some kind of a shortcut, whether that's a brush or a photo reference or something, then I don't think it's so much as a, of a problem. But if, especially if you're trying to learn, yeah, drawing over something does not help you. In fact, I think it actually hurts you. OK, so now I'm kind of excited, because now we can start giving the snail. Or you know what, before I do that, I'm going to add some of these, that texture going down the side of them. And then I'll go ahead and show you guys what I'm excited to show you. What classes should you take? in an art college to get a better feel of digital art besides like traditional art classes? To be honest, the way I've seen it is traditional skills do translate digitally. The only thing that's different between digital and traditional are the software and like learning how the software works and like getting comfortable. Like in this instance, Photoshop. It took me a while to get very comfortable in Photoshop and being like knowing what tools I need, like even knowing, OK, I really want to flip this image, but I don't know how. So then just learning little things like that over time, it just builds up your knowledge base, and then you'll be comfortable in the software. So when like you say, like, what class uh, in school should I take to have a better understanding in digital art? So obviously, like a Photoshop class would help, but that's not to say, I think personally, I learned the most in life drawing. And I think being able to analyze shapes in the way that the human form moves and the anatomy, I think learning those kind of skills are so much more beneficial because then it'll translate into your digital work. Because anyone can learn Photoshop, but it takes time to really understand how to learn to draw. And I think there is a difference. Because you see a lot of people that are great traditionally but then can't work digitally, but then give them a few months to become more comfortable with the software and they'll be just as good, if not better, than the people in the class that knew Photoshop beforehand. Tim, if I were to email you uh, work that I wanted you to take a look at, if you had the time, what would be the best format to send it as? A PSD with all the layers or just a JPG? Probably a PSD with all the layers. But I know that uh, soon I won't be accepting, because I have been I, I do this a lot where I will accept any work, and I'll do a paint over, and I'll kind of critique and then send it back. But as I get more wrapped up with the workshop stuff, I'm going to keep that limited to people that sign up for the workshop. And then I'll give more of a personal opinion on that kind of stuff. Just because of time. And uh, I don't have that much time to the day to even like do my own work, my own personal work that I want to keep doing. All right, so I'm focusing right now on the left side of the snail. So let's go ahead and give it that slimy texture. Because you notice I keep talking about how I haven't added any highlights. So let's go ahead and grab this highlight color that I'm using here. And let's lay it right on top of the surface. 
So while I'm doing this, I'm looking at the references and being like, okay, so that's kind of how it treats the lighting. It's not very, it's not a flat surface. It's very irregular. So I'm going to try to recreate the best I can. Oh, but before I even lay on my highlights, i got to keep in mind, okay, now where's the light source? So I'm going to flip it. Let's lay on this light. So it's almost like a speckle highlighting. Get on the lip here. And I'm working with the uh, shapes that I've already laid down on where I'm lay laying down my highlights to keep it more cohesive on the whole lighting scenario here. And that's why people, I think, get too excited to do highlights too early because they really can add value and shape out different areas. But you can also overdo it and you can do it too early. So I, I recommend really building up a solid base before you go ahead and do any highlighting, and that way you'll, be, you'll feel much more confident in um, laying down the highlights because you have such a good foundation to work on top of. For your class, do you think it's okay to have a different software than you have? I have Sketchbook Pro 6. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not, I'm not going to do anything really software specific. And if it is something, like there will be a few things like setting up keyboard shortcuts that I think is really important. But you can obviously do that in different softwares. Now there are some, like I know Mischief is really weird about setting up your own keyboard shortcuts. But that's not to say um, I can work around that and help you the best I can in whatever software you're working with. So I would say I'm not fully familiar with other softwares besides Photoshop. I mean, I've definitely dabbled with, like, GIMP, Sketchbook, and um, Mischief, and Alchemy. Like, there are a few ones I've dabbled with. Even Corel Painter I tried for the monthly trial back when I was in school. But uh, I can do my best, and I can even do my own research to help you out the best I can. So even with the body of the snail, you can see how the highlights aren't so much, like, like you would immediately think, oh, well, there would be a highlight here, and that would be kind of it. But if you look at our references, you see how sometimes it catches a lot of that highlight, and it's still kind of that uneven surface. Oops. So while, yeah, I'm probably still going to have one slightly centralized, I'm going to break it up a bit more. In the future, would you be willing to do a full character tutorial in animation style? In the future? Mm-hmm. What future? Future. Oh, future. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know I did the head profile study with Cecilia, and that talks more of, like, um, character animation and how to work uh, in that kind of particular style. But I could definitely do a full character like I said, it, my plate is kind of full at the moment, so I could always find another artist that could do the tutorial on that. Um, that's not to say that, like, who knows, they'll even probably do a better job if they're more comfortable with it, since I'm more used to doing, like, more realistic or fantastical characters, more so than, like, animated ones. Now, here you can see how I'm kind of breaking up the edge, and that little irregularity to it gives it more of that um, appearance, and it gives more interest for the eye to look at. 
And a lot of the times I try to make my edges more interesting either by showcasing a highlight around them without overdoing it, though, only uh, doing it in isolation. But doing something very subtle like this, I think, adds a lot to it. And usually, I like to imagine my bounce lighting. So if the light is coming from that direction, it's going to bounce from the ground and then hit the underside of this mouth right here. Now, it won't be like super lit. like It won't be that bright because it's bounce lighting. But I'm going to make it strong enough so that it gives that appearance and look as if the, uh, the surface here has more of a sheen to it, so it's not so much flat. Down here is where I'm talking about where I'm not trying to add too much to the shadow. I just want to add a little bit ambient occlusion and then just kind of pillow shade up. And this is a great example of where I like to just pull the background color and then draw on top of what I'm working on. So I'm just going to grab this muted purple gray and then literally just edge it out, get rid of all that excess that I don't really want seen. Okay, so now I'm going to focus on the shell because I know we already hit our 3 o'clock, but we started late and I wanted to at least give a sense of the overall snail appearance. So let me go ahead and start working on the shell here. So right away, um, the front part of the, sh the snail is definitely giving more of an appearance to it than the shell. The shell is still reading very flat. Now what I'm going to do is, well one, i got to think, okay, is there a pattern on the shell? Is there something I need to recreate? But I think just for the sake of time, I'm going to keep it more of like this brown, just like a solid brown shell that the snail is uh, donning right now. So I'm just going to clean up some of the edges. And I'm not just going to go like light to dark as I go down and then make it the darkest down here, because the shell, since it's closer to the ground, it's going to be catching some of that bounce light. So I'm going to grab a slightly lighter brown and that's what's going to be the brown at the very bottom of the shell here. Then picking up my background color, edge off this bottom here. Then I'll do the same for the others as I get to them. If you're a painter, why is Blender installed? If what? If you're a painter, why is Blender installed? <laughs> uh, because I work for CG Cookie, and it's kind of like, uh, even though I never use it, uh, we installed it on all the computers that we were given, just because Blender is kind of like the staple of the company. And actually, the reason it's on this computer, because this is a newer one, um, Kent wanted me to help him render something, and to do it quicker, I think it was an animation sequence, uh, we did it through Dropbox, and then I rendered out, like, seeing there are the frames 700 to 900 or something. And I think he used everyone's machine to help him render out uh, that scene as quick as possible. And we did. I think it only took, like, three hours to render an entire scene, which was kind of crazy.
Okay, so now that I've got the shell, kind of have like a basic shading to it everywhere. I mean, it definitely could use some touching up. But let's go ahead and make another new layer. So that's the difference we got going there. And I'm going to give that darker brown a slight... Yeah, something like that. I'm going to give it... I'm going to round it out just ever so slightly more. Because even here it reads very flat just because I'm using... Uh, too little color in the actual shell, and I think that that's what's hurting it right now. Sometimes you have to like look and analyze, okay, what could I add to it to give it more form? And sometimes you add something like this just to help really form it out. And you'll notice that I'm leaving some of that light brown in the actual crease or that edge of the shell because I, I kind of like the appearance that it gives off. And I'll explain that more as we add the highlight because the highlight is what's going to sell the shell. Okay, so I'm going to flip it. So let's go ahead and start adding our highlights. So I'm going to do this on a new layer as well. So that's, this is what that last layer just did. So it just gave it a slight more uh, value to it. So the way that I'm looking at the reference, there's definitely like these small little ridges that form over the shell, and they're like everywhere. So I'm going to do my best to recreate that. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to lay this on pretty strong. And then, you know what, maybe I'll see if a different brush will feel better here. Hmm. I'm not really liking the chalk brush for that one. Let's try this brush, which is the painterly brush. Do you still make 3D stuff? And which software do you use? Uh, unfortunately, I do not. Uh, I was kind of interested in learning ZBrush for a little while, but I think just time, I need to keep focused on my digital work, or at least that's where I like to keep it. But I did work in 3ds Max. That's the what we learned through school. And that's kind of what I've always used. But then for a little while after school, I was using Blender when I was first hired at CG Cookie. But I would say I haven't really touched 3D software since. So I'm starting to like the appearance we're getting here. So this is a good example where I would probably use this brush over a circle brush to help me save time, where I could recreate this look with a circle brush, but it would take me a little longer because it's very rigidy and it's very much uh, time-consuming. And like right now, I'm like trying to finish this before, or like in a convenient time for a stream. And I think if I was using a circle brush, it just wouldn't get done or give the effect I would want in time. So pretty much I'm using this painterly brush, and then what I'm going to do is I'm using uh, the smudge tool, which of people are like, don't use the smudge tool, don't use it. But honestly, every tool is there, and sometimes, yeah, it gets misused or overused, but that's not to say that's bad. That just means that it's just a tool that's been, unfortunately, used very uh, either too often or incorrectly too often. So I have one of my good friends that I went to school with. Her name is Nubia, and she... I would say love the smudge tool. She used it on everything. And yeah, sometimes it did over blur her images in areas, but for the most part, it really added this cool effect that once she kind of got control over and like knew and understood how to use it, I think that's when her pieces became very strong. Because I know there's some tools out there that definitely have that reputation, like Burn and Dodge definitely have that reputation. And those are two I would definitely just... Uh, I would try to stay away from because I think it's really easy to create shadows and depth with those or even like highlights, but I think it's better to really gain the understanding of it than those kind of tools to give you the effect. So I'm just going to go in with my eraser and erase some of what we just created. And that erasing gives it that ridge, and that's kind of the look that I'm going for here. 
You mentioned that you love to make 3D textures in the past. Would you do a tutorial about hand-painted hand texturing for 3D artists, similar to King Art Games, uh, what they did for the Book of Unwritten Tales 2? Maybe. I would definitely want to do like a collab with Jonathan, I think, if I did something like that. Where, yeah, and I definitely know I talked about how I love doing, uh, the, like, unwrapping and then painting the textures. That's something I still enjoy because it's almost like, uh, I'm trying to think. There's one game, and I doubt anyone has really played it. It's called uh, Final Fantasy Dissidia. But they didn't really have any lighting in any of the gameplay. It was all their lights were kind of hand-drawn on the actual surface textures themselves, and I thought that was brilliant, and it saved them uh, time and uh, made the gameplay, I think, a little smoother because then they didn't have to focus on lighting so much because of how well-drawn the lighting was on the materials. So I definitely can do a tutorial kind of on explain why it can be so helpful if you give it that realistic look. Now really quick, I'm erasing some of the lighting here because that shell would be casting the shadow. You can still tell it has a slightly lighter color, but none of that highlight would be in the shadow. And I think this is very important to understand that highlights will never be in shadows, ever. And I think uh, sometimes when I see it, I'm, it makes me cringe a little bit because how can there be a highlight if it's in shadow unless if there's bounce lighting because then that's like the one exception. But for the most part, usually when I see it, it's used incorrectly. So now here, I know earlier we talked about how the head itself would be casting a shadow on the shell. Well, right now, that highlight doesn't really make sense. So I'm going to use my eraser tool and erase some of that highlight. It's kind of go up. And you can see how, okay, that's starting to give the appearance that that head is casting a shadow. Then from here, I would probably maybe even give it some texture. I would probably make the highlights more isolated like we did on the head. So I'm going to grab my highlight color again, and like give just certain areas that pop of a detail highlight. Or even I really like in the reference like where the shell has a slight um, break up to it, like it looks a little wear and tear in some areas. So adding some of those little touches, I think, give that greater sense of not only realism, but something more interesting to look at. Now, there's another good example where I'm not going to have any of those highlights continue into the shadow, into the cast shadow. Because, like I, I was trying to say, is I never draw highlights in shadows, nor will there ever be highlights in shadows, unless if there's bounce lighting. Okay, and then I think I'm going to start wrapping it up soon. So if you guys have any other questions that you want to ask before we end out the stream... Um, and like I said, I'm going to show you guys some of the new brushes that will be available in the pack, which will either be available later tonight or if I really want to add a few more new ones because I got really excited last night after creating one. Uh, it might be early tomorrow morning, but just know that it will be out soon and you guys can download it. Would you possibly do a minor collab with Blenco as an extra portion to the workshop. Um, I'm not familiar with Blendco. Uh, you might have to tell me more about that. Blender Cookie. Oh, okay. I thought it was like an actual different company. No. Blender <laughs> um, Cookie we just call BC. And then like Concept Cookie we called Coco. But yeah, I've never heard Blender Cookie called Blendco. Um, my, maybe. I feel like what I want to teach is very much beginner stuff on like understanding Photoshop and how to translate your traditional skills into digital. Because I feel like a lot of artists that are even really good traditionally, they get really frustrated because it's just learning a new software can be really frustrating. And Photoshop is overbearing. It's not just like a software you open and it's like, oh, okay, this doesn't seem bad. It's like you open and you're like, okay, I'm kind of being bombarded by all these tools and menus and features that I'm not even familiar with any of them. So I want, my whole goal is to make uh, you guys very much more familiar with Photoshop and have like confidence of like I know how to work this software and uh, any problem that I have I can problem solve and figure out what I would need to do.
so I think doing stuff like textures and um, doing the collab with Blender Cookie, I think that might be more intermediate stuff where I want to keep it more leaning toward like beginner knowledge. Although even though I'm saying more beginner knowledge, I think sometimes beginner knowledge or like fundamental knowledge is so much more important than like advanced techniques. Because even learning things of like how to create contrast through hue, I think that's a very basic thing to learn. But if you apply it to like advanced um, drawings or illustrations, you can create beautiful scenes using a very simple technique. So that's not to say I'm trying to like cater toward only beginners. But I think sometimes those techniques get lost when you don't um, learn them out the gate. Can you show the grayscale again after the highlights are finished? Yeah, absolutely. I know, because I could definitely do the snail for another hour, so I'll try to cut it off short. But um, there's definitely things that I would want to work more on where I'm not completely comfortable. Like, even the bottom of the snail here, like, I didn't even work on the area back here. Um, and sometimes with these live streams, sometimes I work faster, just depending on how long I'm talking or if I'm kind of just fidgeting with uh, either rendering something or I'm talking more than I'm thinking about what I'm doing next. But this is a good example of where I probably would need like another half hour to come fully finish this one. So let me edge it out, and then I'll show you guys the new brushes really quick. And then also show the hue and saturation. So yeah, overall, there would be things I still want to include. I, I would probably want to add, you can see how there's more dark textures on the shell itself. Because right now the shell so basic it actually bothers me where I would want to add like little patterns or uh, slight like darkening ridges in places because I think leaving it so basic uh, it doesn't really add any cool effect or um, sometimes they say keep it simple stupid <laughs> but I think in this case I, it would be better if I added more of those uh, patterns and give it more interest Will the sign-up for the class be on the website? Yes. The sign-up of the class will begin either the beginning of August or mid-August. Because we definitely want to final some stuff out. I have to make some of the marketing images for it. So we don't really want to announce anything without anything to showcase for it. Because I think that would be uh, getting too excited and then showcasing something where we don't even have any promo artwork or of like what they'll learn. So yeah, definitely stay tuned for like mid-August, I want to say, will probably be the, the one to look for. Okay, now really quick, this is a good example of the shell back here. I'm going to pull some of that background color and literally lay it right in there. And that will add just that ever subtle sense of depth to it as well. So you can see before, if I undo that enough, before and after, where I like to pull background colors into my work, especially in like my shadow bounce light area, to give it that sense that the light is bouncing around and then um, gives this more depth to it as well. Okay, so I got to stop before I get too much into detailing it. So there's my hue and saturation layer. So then from here I can see, okay, the shell definitely has some nice contrast going on. I probably want to pull up more contrast here. The body of the slug is still really flat. And I think I would need to add more on the body. So the area that I didn't really work on right here, and that's why it is looking so much attention to it down here. And, I mean, if I really want to do, like, a quick fix, I'd probably grab this darker color and do my best to give it more of that shadow without it, like, adding or multiplying the value. But I think for now, I'm feeling pretty good about how the values look. I really like the way that the eye, I'm going to call them socks again, <laughs> just for fun. And I think the way that they turned out, I think it gives that sense of that light is passing through it, and you can kind of see that uh, vein uh, that is showing through. I'll probably make it slightly darker right there, just to really emphasize it in that this clear membrane the light is passing through. And it gives that cool effect. So I really like working with objects that have that subsurface scattering to it. 
And then um, finally, what was the last thing I was going to showcase of the snail? I think that was it. But just know, um, like, I would use my reference and, like, look how cool some of the patterns could look. And I would probably add some of those to the shell itself. And um, even, like, this blue highlight that's going on in this middle reference, that's something where I would pull the color from and then uh, use it in my work. Uh, oh, great. Someone's saying I stock's failing hard here. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Okay, so really quick, let me guys show you some of the brushes that are available that you guys can download. Quickly edge off the snail. So some of the new ones that I'm pretty proud of, uh, we got this curly hair brush, and it's more for like uh, beasts or creatures, but it gives that cool fuzz lint look without it looking um, fuzzy. So it gives a cool, it almost reminds me of like where the wild things are and the fur texture on that. Um, another great one that I like is I updated all the stitch brushes. So now the stitch brushes, uh, they actually have some more of a look to it. So let me make it bigger so you guys can see. So the stitching isn't just a solid black like horizontal bar. I actually went in and gave it some texture to it, and that's for all of them. So the double stitch, the V stitch, and X stitch, all of them have more of a look to it, and it looks a lot better when you apply it to the um, a character. And now even like chain brushes, so oftentimes you'll see like a black silhouette of chain where I changed that, so now they look like chains. So if I grab like a metal color, they actually give more of an appearance of a chain link. Or even for, I did that for the barbed wire one as well. So now it looks more like barbed wire rather than just a black silhouette of barbed wire. So we still have like all the metal and skin brushes, but the one that I'm really excited to showcase, and I'll show it really quick here, is the braid brush. So with black, um, this is what it looks like kind of close up. So you can, can see the effect it gives. But what's cool, if you guys know um, Jinx from League of Legends, this was the example that I got really excited for. She has two really long blue braids. So if I create it here, you can see how the brush follows, and it creates the look of a braid. And I, I think this is like a really great brush you can use if your character has braids, or even if you just need to do a quick Referencing a bridge, uh, this is probably my favorite brush that I've created to date. So this is a cool one. And right now, I try to consolidate it the best I can. Sometimes I think with brushes, we think more is better. But in my opinion, I think consolidating it down to just what you need and like the essentials. So I really got rid of the ones I didn't think were functional or really practical anymore. Like I took out some of the metal ones because I feel like the f there's two that I really use all the time. And I never really used the other ones because I felt like they were very elementary compared to the ones that I created recently. So those are the brushes. And really quick, I'm just going to grab that art book that I was given, and then we will end the stream off. All right. And I want to thank you guys, of course, for coming again to these streams. We do these every Wednesday at 2 p.m. All right. So this was a little art book. I'm sure the light isn't helping here. Uh, her name is August Antoinette. And what's cool if you order art books from individual artists, especially at conventions, they'll remember you. And she even wrote me uh, this really nice message. And I thought that was that, that was really appreciated. But the art that's in here, um, I don't know if you can even see this. I think it's really great to support individual artists like this, because oftentimes I think we get lost on like what is popular, or uh, well, I'm out of breath just from running up the stairs. That's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> uh, fan art stuff, and I think um, doing or buying work that's more original. I think it's more interesting, and oftentimes you'll see a different side of art that you might not normally see because you're so uh, you're given so much like media art or entertainment art. Where I think stuff like this that's more original is more interesting. So yeah, I just wanted to show you guys that really quick. And last note: if any of you are in the California area 
and you're going to Comic Con this weekend, uh, try to find me. And if you want to say hi, like I said, I have no one to talk to since I'm going alone. Um, I'll be wearing the Concept Cookie shirt, and I'll have a green bandana on. So thank you guys for watching this stream, and hopefully we'll see you next week. And DeAndra, say bye as well. Bye. <laughs>